Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar on the subject of contaminant spills. I'm your host, Cray Price with the International Water Training Institute. And on behalf of the Australian Water School, we are excited to bring you today some of the latest advances in detecting organics and DNA in waterways. So let's have a look at the global spread of our audience today. Uh, welcome to each of you who uh, might be joining us for this interactive live session, as well as to those of you who will be watching this later on via the recording. Now, looking at this globe, um, you know, a lot of our previous content has been geared around surface water modeling uh, over the land. Um, here at the Australian Water School, uh, we're making a bit of an effort here to be more well-rounded and more representative of the entire water cycle and for the entire water sector, uh, giving equal treatment to above ground water and below ground water, um, both freshwater and ocean water. And with today's webinar, we're aiming to bring you some more content on the water quality of both the groundwater and surface water. And uh, today we're going to cover a range of chemical pollutants and biological indicators. Uh, but if you want to join us again next week, the two flow team will be discussing pathogens. Um, we're going to also include some links at the end to additional webinars coming up on water quality, wind and wave forces, geomorphology, and a whole range of other topics that span uh, water across the globe uh, in all of its forms. Now, let's introduce our two speakers today. Um, if you can turn your cameras on, we've got Richard Harrison, uh, director of Orsanco, and Helen Barkley, the director of EnviroDNA. Um, so if you can tell us just a little bit about yourselves, um, how your career has brought you to this point, um, where you're coming to us from today, um, which uh, from the look of it is a uh, clear opposite ends of the planet here. Um, let's uh, let's start with Richard. Uh, we'll go in the order that we're uh, having the presentations in, and then we'll hear from Helen. So first over to you, Richard. All right, Cray, uh, happy to give a little background on myself, and uh, my video is not coming on, but uh, I will go ahead and proceed anyway. So I have been in the uh, water uh, resource field for over 35 years. Uh, prior to joining Orsenko about eight years ago, I was a vice president of a large drinking water utility that utilized the Ohio River as its um, water supply. So it was a very natural um, career change for me uh, after 27 years at Norte Water District to move to Orsenko. Uh, where we serve uh, not just a couple hundred thousand folks, but five million folks through drinking 30 drinking water utilities. So that's a little bit about my background. I'm a uh, professional engineer. Helen, uh, in addition to your uh, introduction, you know, um, Richard's going to run through a presentation first, and then Helen's going to introduce us to uh, eDNA, the concept of eDNA. Um, and so let's have a quick look at the poll results uh, before we have Helen's introduction and find out uh, who might have heard about uh, eDNA. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, is maybe a new term for some people. Uh, but when we look at this, uh, it looks like 71% um, in terms of the topic Richard's going to talk about organics detection systems um, have never heard of that um, eDNA is slightly more and actually heard of it but never used so we're about split uh, split there and hardly anyone has actually used it in their work and so hopefully uh, with today's uh, topic you might be able to uh, find out you know why you might want to be able to uh, to use that uh, in your work and what what value it might have so um, Helen in, like I said in addition to your introduction if you could maybe give us a like a one minute description of what that is what is eDNA um, um, recognizing that we'll hear more about it uh, later on. Um, so that way, maybe the attendees can start to formulate some of the questions for you to answer in the background. Sure, sure. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. So I'm Managing Director of EnviroDNA. We're a purpose-driven company based in Australia. I'm coming to you from regional Victoria. So I'm about an hour and a half drive out of Melbourne in some dairy country. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about environmental DNA um, and this is an innovative wildlife survey technique that is really opening the door to some unprecedented levels of biodiversity data and in the context of today I'll be talking about the value and the opportunity we have with eDNA to build really comprehensive biodiversity baseline data and how we can use that kind of baseline data when we come to unfortunate events such as contamination spills and other disasters to once that disaster has occurred go back to a particular river region survey uh, for biodiversity and then have two data sets the before and after of of these events and understand how that event may have impacted biodiversity and the occurrences of different wildlife species specifically so i'll be talking to you about that today my background I'm not a scientist, but I get to work with some amazing scientists 
Uh, my background has really been in the commercialization of some really innovative science and technology over the years. And um, I've worked in the spaces of biodiversity conservation um, and sustainable agriculture primarily. Um, and really, for me, it's about, it's an exciting space to work. How can we bring innovative science to industry to solve real world problems? Um, so that's that's how I've come to be here today. Excellent. All right. Um, so um, now today we're going to be hearing from some you know, well, well, I guess the topics today include some very high profile spills uh, that involve some ongoing disputes. And as a disclaimer for us here at the Water School, we're not interested in pointing fingers at the reasons behind the spills uh, and the events that led up to them happening. What we're focusing on today is how the latest advances in monitoring technology, um, you know, having to look at uh, what's coming down uh, our way, uh, how can these advances help us do a better job assessing the risks to waterways and to public health uh, when these sorts of things happen? So if we can kick it off here with Richard, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right. That sounds okay. great. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to, to speak uh, to this group about a really uh, interesting and useful um, infrastructure project and program that Orsenko has. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Orsenko is an interstate compact organization uh, formed because uh, some 90 years ago, uh, the Ohio River and the interstate waters of, of the Ohio River Basin in, in the, the Midwest of the United States uh, was in deplorable condition. Uh, the problems were, were just too big for one city or, city or community or state to fix. And Orsenko was the answer to that. Uh, we were actually formed by a chamber of commerce uh, through, through their interaction, at least, uh, recognizing uh, that there was such a lost opportunity with having such a wonderful thousand mile long resource like the Ohio River, again, basically a open sewage uh, cesspool. So we were formed as a compact uh, agency, uh, unique uh, in, in the United States. There's really only a half dozen or so of us in, in, in the United States. Uh, we were actually approved by Congress and our eight member states, which include the six states uh, that border the Ohio River, uh, that include Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, New York, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. I am in Ohio right now uh, speaking to you in the US and then also Virginia and um, New York. And so we have three policy uh, board members from each of the states and three federal commissioners appointed by the president of the United States. And this makes up our board of directors, our compact, uh, which was negotiated over 20 years, provides our, our guidance and authority. And our mission is the control of interstate water pollution. And we use committees and, and have immense collaboration to accomplish our mission. So I wanted to highlight one of, one of the key, key components. And for those of you that may not be familiar with United States um, regulation, uh, the Clean Water Act, and as well as Orsenko's Compact, focuses on placing and maintaining the, the uses of a body of water in a satisfactory sanitary condition. And we're talking about making sure that a, that a body of water is suitable for public or industrial water supplies after reasonable treatment, suitable to support aquatic life. We're gonna hear from Helen um, in a little bit. And, and we work in that arena as well from, from an aquatic life standpoint. And, and I, I like the, the malodorous nuisances due to floating solids or sludge deposits. That gives you a visual of the condition of the Ohio River some 80 or 90 years ago and adaptable to other uses. So it's used for navigation. Uh, it's used again for an industrial water supply. And again, we focus on those uses and those are defined by standards. So water quality criteria, if you will, for different chemicals that make up those uses. So a little bit more about our commission. Uh, I have a board of 27 commissioners. These are typically the head environmental officials of the state agencies. And then also uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency is very involved. Uh, we, we do this on a very um, frugal budget. Approximately $3 million is our base funding with about half of that coming from the federal government through what is called a Clean Water Act uh, great. And I have a staff of 22 folks, so I'm, I'm really proud of our team. We do, a, we do an amazing uh, amount of work with, with that very small 
15. So when we talk about the Hyro Basin as a watershed, we're talking about a huge geographical area of 530,000 square kilometers or 205,000 square miles serving 30 million folks all a part of all a part of 14 states high diverse land use and again another another um, shot of the higher basin uh, there there is a lot of confusion in the public and what it means to be a part of a basin and how it works we have 275,000 miles of assessed streams and rivers in the higher river basin meaning uh, they have been assessed for their compliance with the clean water act and approximately 40% of these are impaired. And I should say impaired means uh, that they do not meet the requirements of the Clean Water Act as defined by standards and, and, and making sure they can meet those uses. So some facts, uh, we're talking about a, a near 1600 kilometer long uh, river from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania down to Cairo, Illinois. It's a, it's a very long, great river. Drinking water supply for 5 million folks through 33 drinking water intakes from 30 drinking water utilities. Uh, these are located all along the, the Ohio River, all the way from Pennsylvania to Illinois. Uh, there are 20 locks and dams for flood control and navigation, primarily navigation. And then it's an incredible recreation water resource, abundance in fish species, uh, just, just an incredible body of water. It, power generation is a huge use of the river. And, and 185 million tons of cargo, mainly coal, is transported annually along the river. So as I mentioned, uh, we, we do a lot of work. We do, we do work, again, to protect the uses for source water protection, which I'm going to talk for most of my presentation. We do a lot of water quality monitoring to support recreation, bacteria monitoring. We, we do contaminant monitoring, whether it's for human health, aquatic life, uh, making sure we understand the level of chemicals in, in the water. We do special projects. We just completed a very uh, extensive PFAS uh, project on the Ohio River. Biological programs. These are these are great programs for indicators of the water quality of a body of water. So when you talk about Helen's program for eDNA, I'm very interested in that because having that baseline would also be very useful for trends. Looking at fish aquatic life, bugs, macroinvertebrates, you know, all uh, great indicators of, of the health of a a particular body of water like the Ohio River. Uh, we have regulatory program work. Uh, we predate the Clean Water Act by over two decades. So we, we have authorities um, in um, regulatory arena. We have standards for the Ohio River uh, that we maintain. And we also have a robust public involvement program uh, for litter cleanups, uh, showing the life uh, within, the, within the river through our aquarium program. So just think about this, 20, 22 employees, 13 of us are scientists, 14 if you count me. I, I've become more of a, of a management person, even though I'm a civil engineer by training. And these are these, this is our footprint of a typical annual sampling uh, location. Again, just think about 13 folks conducting the sampling. A lot of those sampling sites are organics detection system. I'll talk about that momentarily. So I'm I'm going to step back and I could do I could do discussions on on all of those programs, but I'm going to focus on source water protection and in particular I'm going to talk about spill monitoring and response related to protecting the Ohio River and its tributaries for their use as a drinking and industrial water source after reasonable treatment. We we invest a significant amount of resources for the monitoring for spills, and I'll explain why momentarily. So this is just a a slide of of a Typical large chemical spill and what it can do uh, to change an incredible river. Generally speaking, the Ohio River is a wonderful resource. It's improved water quality immensely over the last 75 years. It's an incredible drinking water supply. My utility served 300,000 people and uh, was, was a, a very large utility with 2,000 uh, kilometers of drinking water pipe. Uh, and normally things were, were really good, but from time to time we'd have spills that would really, really shake things up. So I want to give you a little background. This was this was generated by US EPA. The study period was eight years between 2010 and 2018, and it focused on uh, larger spills, uh, those greater than 400 liters, uh, and and really just want to show why this part of the country it's so important to have a spill monitoring program like Orsenko has. So this, this is all preliminary uh, data that I'm about to show you, but you can see, um, and, and uh, Craig, I should have told you to put your cursor there on the right. 
uh, where, where the, where the moat, yep, we're talking about the Ohio River Basin and the Ohio River right through there. That's, that's the, the area that uh, we work in. So you can see why it's, it's important to have a good spill response program. So this is a little breakdown of typical spills. And so where Sanko's uh, organics detection system, which, which I'll explain further in, in just a moment, focuses on volatile organic chemicals. And, and these are generally gonna be um, volatile organic chemicals and they make up the footprint for common spill materials. That's why we focus on those with our system. I won't go through all of these, but you, you can see that there's a significant amount of petroleum um, related products that, that make up a typical spill. So as I said, normally the higher river is an incredible resource that has to meet multiple competing uses. And, and, and really many places in the world would, would just consider themselves so fortunate to have such an incredible resource uh, in their backyard serving them. Um, just, just again for aquatic life, uh, recreation, uh, and also industrial use. We have competing uses and we value all of that. And, and so in, in comes our organics detection system. That is our key infrastructure to help us respond to, to the needs of 5 million folks that rely on the Ohio River as their drinking water supply and the 30 utilities that serve them. In the United States, uh, there is the United States Coast Guard and they maintain a national response center system. It is a reporting mechanism for spills. Not every spill is reported but quite a few are. We receive on a 24 seven basis, approximately 600 of those reports. My, my small but mighty team carries what I call the bat phone and they carry a cell phone and, and literally take these calls on a 24 seven basis. We screen them, determine which ones might have an impact on the drinking water supply. We communicate that to the 30 drinking water utilities up and down the river on a 24 seven basis. And then from time to time, there are really large spills that have just potentially profound impacts on drinking water. Uh, we have a spill model that is a time of travel hydrology model that allows us to look at precipitation forecast and, and actually uh, track a spill uh, potentially down the river and predict when a spill might reach a certain portion of the river. So bring in our organic detection system. This was established after a large carbon tetrachloride release to the Ohio River in 1978. And the beauty of the system is that Orsanko, I have three team members that work in this area. We, we install it. We, we take all the data back to our headquarters in Cincinnati. And then we also um, work with the drinking water utilities that actually host it. So the utilities operate it at their utility up and down the river. So it gives us really a strategic approach to this. We have 16 active stations on the Ohio River. So this is the deployment of our system along the Ohio River. We have different um, types of um, instrumentation, laboratory instrumentation. We have, we have GC mass spectrometers. We, we have continuous monitoring systems that are, are a little less sophisticated, but they, they allow us to take in water around the clock at certain intervals. And, and then we also have GC mass specs with FID on these sites. And so you can see uh, in those areas there uh, up river, um, you can see that there's a lot more of our different um, systems there. And that's where a lot of spills do occur as you can recall back to the, the map I showed you from the US Environmental Protection Agency. So we program these, uh, calibrate them with 30 common um, volatile organic chemicals, but the system can, this, this allows us to quantify how much is in the um, river or in a sample, but we can detect thousands of, of chemicals in the library with this system. So I'll just detail a couple of large spills in 2014. We had a 10,000 gallon four methyl cyclohexane methanol, also known as MCHM spill, um, released by Freedom Industries, who, who subsequently went uh, out of business. And it was only 1.5 miles upstream of a large West Virginia drinking water utility. It actually ended into the, up in their system. It was a big challenge, but it also was a challenge downstream. So this is the chemical um, storage uh, complex that failed. 
And so these are, these are graphs of the plume, and this is how our organics detection system helps. So by going upstream uh, several hundred miles from where I am in Cincinnati, Ohio, we could tell that the magnitude of the spill was, was quite a bit higher um, and we could get the duration. And so we track this to every drinking water utility up and down the river, and we could tell them when it was going to arrive, plus or minus a couple hours, so they could shut down their intakes and allow the majority of the spill to pass. You can imagine as a utility operator or governmental entity, how valuable having this type of information for a chemical that nobody really knew anything about. Uh, we, we had some estimates of its potential impact uh, from a health risk standpoint, but this was invaluable data. I'm gonna talk about a, another incident in, in 2017. It was a, a urea ammonia nitrate barge failure. And we had thousands of gallons of this, this chemical um, that was a, a, a basically a, a fertilizer, uh, but it, it could cause significant impacts to drinking water utilities and so we, we again tracked this. Uh, in this case, it was heading towards a very large, serving over a million folks in Louisville Water, Kentucky utility. And so we had to work on that as well. So again, this equipment uh, allows us to, to monitor, detect, and quantify this. So that is a plume um, upriver from the utility in question that helped them make treatment decisions. So, the, so this shows how they were able to close their intakes for a very short period of time and shave off the bulk of that contaminant. So I'm, this is the East Palestine, Ohio train derailment. There's been an incredible amount of news on this, uh, even internationally, um, about a major uh, train derailment by Norfolk Southern. And, and Cray is showing his cursor at where this uh, event started for us. And although it, it started some 40 miles from the Ohio River, we didn't expect it to reach the Ohio River. The thought was it was contained but lo and behold, our organics detection system, uh, our first system, which is at, at point four there, uh, we got a detect for that. And that started just an incredible response. I have not missed a day of work in the last uh, 60 plus days. And, and my team has worked extensively on this. And we focused on protecting the Ohio River. And so that started a very significant monitoring uh, process for the Ohio River that really got a lot of national and, and even international attention. I believe this is where Cray reached out to me, was, was seeing our response. I even was uh, requested to testify to the United States Senate um, about our successful response. So, so this is the map showing the different locations. We use our time of travel model to trace the um, spill down the Ohio River. We, we had crews uh, go out and take samples on the river. And we did this for over 600 miles. Um, so that's a lot of traveling. That's a lot of labor. But then we were able to take these sample results, run them on our equipment on an overnight basis, and within hours have data, where if we use the contract lab, it could take days or weeks. So th this is the sample results. And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, but suffice it to say that uh, the highest level and the chemical we were really focusing on was butyl acrylate. It's a semi-volatile organic chemical, really, really a volatile organic chemical, and our system was able to detect it. Uh, we were able to detect it and show this reach the river. Then we were able to get a sample of that actual chemical, as well as two other chemicals that we were able to detect. The 2-ethyl hexanol um, is another chemical. We can get samples of that and then calibrate our equipment to quantify that. And so we were able to do that very quickly and then trace this all the way down the river. We provided this information on our website, just like you see it here. We updated it daily and we were able to provide information that really helped show that the drinking water supply was not at risk from this particular chemical spill. The highest amount we measured was a little over four parts per billion. And we have an organization called ATSDR uh, and they were able to develop uh, provisional health guidance numbers. And if you can see those at the bottom of that slide, 560 parts per billion, 500 parts per billion. So when we're getting um, four parts per billion um, and being able to share that with our drinking water utilities and the 5 million th folks that utilize the river for the supply, that's very useful information. There's a lot of hysteria with this. A lot of folks don't understand how water flowed 
And so this information was invaluable and we were able to track this. Uh, we were able to track this and, and really by the time it reached about uh, 250 miles downstream from where it hit the Ohio River near the Pennsylvania Kentucky border, um, we were no longer detecting it at, the, at quantifiable levels. And so by providing that to all of our drinking water utilities, we just kept moving down the river. That was, that was very useful information and, and it really removed the Ohio River from having significant concern and allowed US EPA, the states, Norfolk Southern, uh, emergency responders to really focus on the scene at East Palestine, Ohio. And again, more uh, non-detects, but the, the, you can see we're, we're moving on down. We're, we're at mile 791 now. Uh, we're, we're over, actually over 700 miles down river from where we started our monitoring. I'm gonna end my, my uh, talk there. Uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of overview of Orsenko and then how we use this wonderful system to, to help uh, protect uh, folks along a thousand mile river, like the Ohio River. Turn it back to you, sir. All right, thanks, Richard. That was awesome. Look forward to hearing from Helen. I can see your screen now, so that's coming through fine. And we'll hear about eDNA. So the questions that you have on Richard's presentation, you can keep those going in the background. He'll be online to ask, answer those, and then we'll come back on for a bit of a panel discussion. So Helen, over to you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Richard. So the perspective that I'm bringing today is biodiversity. Um, looking at, imagine if we could have a system as comprehensive as that, that is monitoring biodiversity, which as Richard pointed out, um, there can be some great indicator species for waterway health, but also for monitoring biodiversity in it of itself and the importance of biodiversity to, to our world and to human health. So when we're thinking about biodiversity and wondering about the impacts on biodiversity of these spills or other high hazard events where we're asking the questions such as what wildlife and plant species have been impacted? Is species richness being reduced? So the count of native species in a particular region. Is species distribution being impacted? So the occurrences of species across a river system or across a region. Are we seeing complete loss of a species? And what is the immediate impact after these disastrous events? Um, or, you know, the future impact that might occur? And is biodiversity recovering as a result of intervention efforts or as time passes? So these are some of the sorts of questions that you might be interested in asking when it comes to thinking about the impact on biodiversity. And as a, as a um, I guess, a top line or, a, you know, at a very minimum, what we need to be doing is um, or answering this question, what species are where? That's the sort of data at a very, very starting point that we need to be generating to understand um, those, those sorts of impacts on biodiversity. And I'm sure that a number of you would be familiar with different wildlife survey techniques. So I've got a picture up here to help demonstrate um, a range of different uh, conventional tools that have been in use for many years to detect biodiversity. And I'm talking about wildlife biodiversity here. Um, so you've got your visual type tools where you're out there actually looking to spot an animal. You might be out at night with a torch spotlighting, looking for nocturnal animals. You might be sitting by a waterway and spotting birds. You might be doing audio surveys. So listening for frog calls and um, detecting frog species based on their different, their different calls. Uh, it could be trapping surveys where you're actually capturing animals and you're taxonomically identifying them and, and releasing them. Uh, you might be finding different traces of animals by looking at footprints and trying to identify from footprints or animal scats or hair that you might be finding. Um, so some of those techniques that I've just highlighted, um, you know, can have limitations. You know, they can be very inefficient, very laborious um, and can be quite costly and sometimes are not effective um, and, and, and are not highly sensitive at detecting species and may actually miss species that are present in the environment. Um, and so this is, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for innovation, I suppose, when it comes to biodiversity detection. And I'll be talking to you today about one of those innovative tools being environmental DNA, um, which is highlighted there on the screen, uh, which addresses um, a number of limitations. And what it's doing 
is it's opening the door to more biodiversity data than has been previously possible to, to gather. Uh, we're able to look for more species across broader scales over increasing time frames. Um, and it's allowing us and giving us this opportunity to have feasibility for developing broad scale biodiversity baselines. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that's what I'll be talking about and highlighting in my talk is um, imagine if we could have biodiversity baselines across key regions um, that allow us when there is some kind of significant impact, uh, a spill, um, some other disaster, we're able to then go back after the, after the fact, undertake some more eDNA wildlife surveys, and then be able to compare pre and post um, the impact to understand what it has meant for biodiversity. So I'll be talking about that. Before I get into it, just quick introduction to who we are um, in BioDNA and what eDNA is. Um, so our company, EnviroDNA, we're a purpose-driven business. We're based in Melbourne in Australia. Um, and we're in the business of generating big biodiversity data. And we want to see this revolutionise how we go about managing biodiversity and protecting biodiversity um, and making important decisions along the way in, in a range of different industries. So we work with organisations such as water corporations, mining, government, conservation organisations and environmental consultancies. And we've been developing um, te the technology and the science over the last eight years and we focused on that side, but most importantly, we're focused on bringing eDNA to industry um, in really accessible tools that give people access to this very innovative genetic biodiversity survey technique. So what is environmental DNA, eDNA for short? The idea is that all living things are shedding DNA into their surrounding environment. So it could be by things like skin cells, hair, feces, fish slime, bodily secretions, basically. Um, and we're able to take samples from the environment and extract that DNA and then determine what species have left that DNA behind. So the tool is about detecting species presence. Um, and being able to map the distribution of species across regions. Um, we might be looking for native or invasive species or whole groups of species. So um, a common question that pops up is, oh, can you use this to detect abundance and understand abundance or other health indicators of a particular wildlife species? Not yet. Um, it's, there are some opportunities for inferring abundance, um, but at this stage, the tool is about presence and detecting presence of species. It's highly sensitive um, in a number of situations and the research that has been flooding into this area over the last 10 years just continues to increase year on year. One particular species I wanted to highlight, which is close to our heart, is Australia's amazing iconic platypus, um, a freshwater species that we are very lucky to have here in Australia. Uh, some of my colleagues have spent many years um, studying this species and using traditional methods uh, for um, detecting this species, which involve fike nets, um, where you set nets um, across, a, across a waterway and you're detecting those species throughout the evening. Um, they're nocturnal, so it's very laborious and often you don't catch a platypus. So we thought, is there a better way? Um, and we, through developing eDNA techniques and working with a pioneering organisation, organization here in Australia, Melbourne Water, we developed a tool for, for detecting platypus using eDNA and determined to get to a 95% chance of detecting a platypus. If it's there, you need two eDNA samples just to compared to six to 10 fight net surveys. So that really highlights the opportunity here of efficiency when it comes to detecting biodiversity. Um, and how does it work? So the first step is in the field, thinking about what sample, environmental sample, are you going to be collecting? May it be a soil sample, um, a, a, a water sample, which we're probably really focused on today. And in fact, water is an excellent 
uh, sample for eDNA. DNA distributes quite homogeneously within a water and an aquatic environment. You don't have to sample exactly where the species was. So it really is an exciting opportunity. You can just get down to the side of the river, take your samples, move on to your next site and off you go. You're not trying to catch, see or hear an animal to know if it's there. The next step is, um, sorry, and in terms of some examples of what it looks like, you can see there's a, a manual sample now, there's a syringe pushing water through a filter. It can be as simple as that. We do a lot of citizen science engagement um, with that kind of approach, but there's also some more, um, I guess, heavy duty systems for those that are out there regularly, maybe surveying large bodies of water. This is a pump system that allows you to pump water through a filter to collect the DNA on that filter. And then the next step is in the lab. Um, this is where we're extracting DNA, we're looking for specific DNA sequences, we have a library of DNA sequences of different um, species and there are some global databases that we're able to pull on, but we also generate our own DNA um, sequence information um, and then we're using that to detect once we've picked up on a DNA sequence which species owns it or we might be looking for a particular species of interest. So the two ways that we're looking at that data or generating that data we're either looking for a particular species it could be a native species or an invasive species and we're actually trying to in a particular environmental sample look for the DNA of that species and that's all that we're thinking about. Um, the other option which is um, particularly exciting for this broad scale biodiversity mapping type work is using eDNA metabarcoding. And that's where not just looking for one species, we're actually looking to look at all the DNA from groups of species. So it could be that we're looking for all the fish DNA and we're looking for all the decapod DNA or all the vertebrate DNA in general. And then we're, we're identifying species um, within those groups. In terms of application of eDNA wildlife and biodiversity data, um, perhaps from the interests of, of some of you folks online today, you could be looking at baseline generation and ongoing monitoring, general impact assessment or hazard events assessment, um, informing management actions, where do we need to focus our efforts, where are there threatened species, where are there early invasions of invasive species, um, water health um, and some of the, um, the life that's important to water health, source tracking for bacterial contamination in waterways um, and even citizen science engagement where that's important. I want to talk about some examples with regards to this idea of developing biodiversity baselines and a client that we've worked with and has been pioneering, I mentioned earlier, is Melbourne Water. So they manage 25,000 kilometres worth of um, rivers and creeks and thousands of wetlands in and around Greater Melbourne. They've got 69 sub catchments and they have a healthy waterway strategy which spans 10 years. Um, and they've been doing this for four years where they've gone about looking at biodiversity and what they call their key environmental values, such as birds, fish, platypus, and some particular species of interest. And they've used traditional survey techniques for the last 20 years up until recently, where we've worked with them to now run and develop an eDNA program. And they're mapping um, biodiversity across these 25,000 kilometres worth of their, their waterways, that's 1,800 different sampling sites um, and we're able to visualise, um, sorry, I didn't have that up there before, but there are all the different many sampling sites and we have an app that allows them to actually visualise their data and search on different species groups of interest. We're also able to biobank those samples and look at them later. Um, some examples that are particularly relevant to this idea of spills and monitoring um, the impact of biodiversity um, as a result. So this is also within this Melbourne Water Project. Um, there was a spill in this creek. Um, I don't know if, can you, um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but there just towards the bottom of the screen, there is a lake and there was a, a spill in that lake. We already had baseline data that we've collected as part of this Melbourne Water Program. And so we were able to um, go ahead, sample after this spill event, um, and have a look at what the impact was. So here you can see the biodiversity, the list that we have across these different, um, a select group of these sites uh, that we had and site 
0.135, the results there are indicating presence of those species which happened in the baseline study before any event. And then these sites are indicating the species um, detections that occurred after that spill event. And just by eyeballing it, um, you can see that there is certainly a drop off in species detection and occurrences um, and it's allowed them to make some decisions about further monitoring and what their actions are. Another example is there was an emergency discharge that occurred um, at a Melbourne water facility at a, uh, during a flood and a high a rainfall period. Um, once again we had the biodiversity baseline data and we were able to undertake post-emergency eDNA biodiversity surveys to identify what species had been impacted. Something a little bit different but also um, in this context of you know a disastrous event and how it might impact biodiversity in 2019 2020 the summer here in Australia uh, was a very scary one actually we had some significant bushfires um, some of the most significant we've ever had in terms of the extent and severity of those bushfires um, particularly uh, um, yeah basically we we the estimate was about one billion animals native animals were lost Amazingly, for another project that we had undertaken, we had already generated, um, so this is the region, we've got Victoria, where Melbourne is down there, you can just see Melbourne, this is New South Wales, and you can see Sydney just there on the, on the east coast, and the yellow being the regions affected by fire, it was very extensive. Um, we actually had already undertaken some eDNA samples across approximately 400 sites over these um, some of these fire affected regions and were able to go back um, somewhat immediately after these bushfires when we could gain access to the sites and undertake further eDNA sampling. We then took another round of eDNA sampling 12 months after this impact. So we were able to track through time the Im impact, the immediate impact, and then what did it look like 12 months later? And also start to see, are we seeing recovery of, of certain animals? Well, what does it look like? So I just wanted to share some of those examples to bring to life this idea and, and the exciting um, possibility that eDNA presents that to create biodiversity data and how big biodiversity data can lead to powerful insights and decisions um, when it comes to looking at the impacts of, of spills and other big events and general management of biodiversity and waterways. Some of the future um, in this space is very exciting. Imagine if we could have autonomous monitoring of eDNA in waterways. Um, we're very excited to see some, um, some possibilities in the future for that. There is in-field testing, um, which is currently available, that can be offered for particular use and applications when you want to know immediately, is there an invasive species here I need to know within the next hour? There is that kind of opportunity of in-field testing. Um, there's uh, we're doing R&D at the moment looking at air sampling and the ability to pick up um, species DNA in the air. So it's a very exciting space. I could talk a lot more about it with you, but I'll leave it at that so that we can have a bit more of a discussion and welcome you to reach out um, if you do have further questions that we don't cover. Thanks, Richard. All right. Okay. Well, we'll bring, yeah, Richard, if you can turn your camera back on again. Um, what we'll do now is have a bit of a panel discussion. Uh, thanks so much for that, uh, Helen. Uh, eDNA is a term, I got to admit, I I hadn't heard of it and, you know, I'm 50 something years old. Uh, I went to, you know, the first so many years of my life and never heard of this before. I mean, it's it's been something recently emerging, but it's been around for a few years and it just went right over my head. So when I heard about it and I've seen it just pop up this year in a bunch of studies that I've seen and getting it scoped out, this is something that is up and coming. And it uh, the 50% of you that had heard of it, congratulations, you're uh, smarter than I am um, <laughs> and uh, more, more well versed in uh, what's going on in technology. But when I heard about it and heard what it might do, I thought, let's get this out there. And then tying it together to some of the really prominent uh, spills that are going on at the moment, you know, we asked that question: Are you, uh, you know, are you uh, confident about the future? And a lot of people thought uh, that, you know, this, you know, we're we're going to get uh, worse impacts going forward uh, based on the poll results. Um, 
but that's in spite of all this advancing technology, which means the only way that's going to happen is because there's so much potential out there for uh, infrastructure that might just be falling apart uh, to result in some of these spills. Now, um, Helen, I'll give you a chance to go through. There's a ton of questions there for you. If you can have a look at those, type any answers you can, and then we'll uh, have you answer any of those live that you'd like to. Uh, Richard, great to see you here um, uh, back again with us. If you can answer a couple of these questions for us, Richard, in the meantime that have come in, you know, one of the questions was, you're saying that you only sample 30 contaminants, but you have access to thousands of them. Uh, how, how does that work? Um, how, do you, how do you get the other ones that you're not sampling? You can actually order, and that's a great question. So those 30 chemicals, the way we were able to calibrate our instruments for them was to actually get a sample of that chemical. So normally uh, it, it can detect uh, within its library uh, a, a certain uh, chemical that has properties, but you can't tell how much. So by getting an actual sample of that chemical. So for instance, we or you can order overnight uh, a sample of butyl acrylate, for instance, which was one of the main chemicals we tracked in the East Palestine spill. Once we got that sample, we can inject it into the organics or in the detection system, the GC mass specs. And then that will give a uh, specific <laughs> concentration that's injected to compare what's in, in the river with to give you a concentration. So it, it takes it from, from just, hey, we know this is in there to be able to tell us in a, a parts per trillion basis or parts per billion basis, depending on what we're looking at, um, how much we, we have of that chemical. Okay. And, and that's what we were able to do. We were able to see these chemicals <clears throat> in, in very trace amounts, and then we were able to quantify them so the utilities would know that, hey, it's approximately two parts per billion uh, in, in your part of the river. Okay. Well, and then another question that's come in um, about oil spills. Uh, say there was an oil spill um, just, you know, tomorrow, and uh, you were given a presentation like this about that oil spill over the next, uh, you know, in the next month or so. Would anything that you've said be any different, you know, in terms of what you would use to pick that up? Um, you know, it, you know, oil spills tend to be one of the most uh, prominent things that happen generally along a coast, and you don't have the coastline for you, but uh, you do have uh, some potential for that with some of the traffic going up and down the river. Anything that would be unique to an oil spill? Um, based on, compared to what you talked about today already? Not, not unique, but unique, easy for me to say, not unique. But what we do uh, is every day, uh, 365 days a year, uh, this system generates about 1,400 results. And, and so we're able to not only use this during the spill, but afterwards. And, and so we can very quickly determine whether we're, we're seeing that particular chemical, oil, diesel, benzene, whatever might be there um, in the river. Now for aquatic life, we, we actually electrofish. And so we survey each pool on the Ohio River roughly every seven years, uh, pretty laborious, but we then assess the health of those pools. And so we can determine over time how those pools from an aquatic life fish species, macroverta species are doing. Excellent. All right. Now, if you can have a look uh, while Helen's talking, uh, maybe have a look at any of the other ones, because I'm going to come back to you and ask you to, you know, whether it's the most upvoted ones or maybe one you've already answered. Uh, have a look at some of those questions. We'll only have a chance to get to a couple of them. Um, maybe we'll respond personally or with some uh, additional resources for some of the ones we won't have a chance to get to. Uh, Helen, I'm just going to uh, turn it over to you uh, to choose which question to answer. Those watching this YouTube recording won't see the questions and answers. So maybe just repeat the question, um, even if those uh, who are watching live would have seen it. So, uh, yeah, just go ahead and pick uh, pick the one that you, you maybe okay, one or two yeah. that's, that you think are the most significant. <laughs> OK, well, one question. This is an interesting one Do you, um, about the cost of eDNA. And do you think the cost of kit and analysis is likely to measurably reduce uptake? Um, this person, Peter, thank you for your question. I'm excited about getting into to the program of eDNA sampling, but a bit concerned about the potential costs of robust, robust sampling and sequencing. Um, so, so it's becoming more and more cost effective and probably the best way to give you a, a bit of a feel for it, um, Melbourne Water, when they used to do their platypus um, monitoring program using FICnet surveys, that was an annual program and they would survey approximately 20 waterways. Um, 
And then we developed the eDNA platypus uh, monitoring technique. And this is a, a high level, but um, we're for the same cost now able to monitor more than a hundred waterways for platypus distribution. So, I mean, that just at a high level shows you that cost comparison um, because there's a lot of efficiency opportunity um, gained and we're also able to get a lot more data from, from the sort of samples that we're getting, you know, more species than just looking for one species and maybe, you know, you can get fish and um, frogs from the one sample rather than doing frog audio surveys, which can be highly ineffective and laborious and electrofishing. Um, so just to bring that to life a little bit. Okay, well, now one question, that this is a great question. I, well, I think because I, it's something I hadn't thought of while you were talking. Uh, what, what about just uh, random people who have exotic pets or something in their, uh, in, in the, you know, and they, they, you know they'll, they'll have some aquarium and they just dump the water into the, uh, uh, you know, ends up in the wastewater. Uh, yes. Do you have a way of screening out um, things that might not uh, be real, uh, real species that are uh, present there in the catchment? Yeah, so a part of this um, this whole space of eDNA is there is an element of ground truthing data. So what's important when we're looking at, um, so we overlay databases, we've got some knowledge, for example, in Australia, um, there's some extensive databases of um, biodiversity and what's kind of known to be where. So we use those kind of databases to help ground truth um, and we flag through our pipelines, our bio bioinformatic pipelines and our amazing data scientists are able to automatically flag um, detections that need a bit of a, an eyeball. Um, so we've certainly had those examples. As one example, we had a marine species pop up inland Australia and we we're thinking, how did that get there? But it was only in one sample um, and it was likely probably a water bird that had brought that species and dropped it in there. So there is that kind of interpretation of the data, but there's certainly, um, I guess, the the importance of the data management and interpretation. It needs to be part of the eDNA conversation. Excellent. Now that's, uh, again, there's so many questions coming in and I'm wondering, you know, th this may indicate um, so much interest that we do a dedicated eDNA uh, webinar going forward in the future. And as you exit, uh, you know, we're coming up on the hour here. Um, and if you need to run, uh, just come back and watch the rest of this recording later. We're only going to go for another couple of minutes. But uh, yeah, keep those, uh, you know, with these questions, we may get a chance to answer some of these uh, offline and we'll put them in with the resources because we're not going to be able to get to uh, all of these today but thanks so much everybody for your uh questions and your interest in this this shows us that it is something that everybody's interested in and uh you know that that it is something we may choose to uh, dedicate a, a full session to uh in the future uh richard um over to you for um we'll, we'll probably just do one more uh you know choose one more topic or question that you've addressed or that you've seen asked here um and uh you know and then we'll 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 have you do one and then turn it over to helen to have her do one uh so uh any anything you've seen on here on the chat line that uh, that you'd like to hit or uh, any closing remarks you'd like to make? I did see a, a, a comment, which which is true. The Ohio River, uh, the Rhine River was mentioned, are, are slow flowing rivers. And that does make a difference. So they're, they're great rivers. And so like the Ohio River traveled uh, in, 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 in many cases a mile per hour. So, you know, we, we were talking about um, 25 miles of movement in a day. It would be very different in a, in a fast flowing stream. So I think that's a good point. Uh, this, this is something somewhat specific to the uh, utilization on, on the Ohio River, but it's been an incredible resource uh, for us. And it really, I think in many ways, helped save the day for uh, informing folks on the Ohio River uh, related to these Palestine spills. And thanks Excellent. for having me. All right, no, thanks for that. Um, Helen, over to you, uh, any closing remarks or just uh, you know, any, any last uh, of these technical questions that you wanted to hit uh, before we take that offline? Okay, I'm sure that many people would wonder this as well, which is how far can eDNA travel in water? I mean, how does that impact? Might you get false positive? It's, and you know, you know, you're detecting a species that might be 20 meters up or 100 meters up or even further up, which is true. So DNA does travel in waterways. And that's why you think about your sampling design and you're not just sampling a river from one location. You know, you've got sampling um, 
sampling sites across a water body and then you're able to look at the data as a whole and understand um, where you might be seeing concentrations and it's just like capturing an animal if you capture an animal where your net is that animal moves around in that waterway so it's really about understanding are the species present in that waterway and thinking about how you sample to to gain further insights around that all right well thanks so much richard and helen um and uh you know this is representative of a whole lot of people behind the scenes you both have teams out there working very hard behind the scenes uh you know bringing this stuff to light and so you know thanks to you and to your teams and you know well especially to you for bringing on uh you know bringing the subject to light for us here as the australian water school and to all the global attendees um our presenters do this uh, uh as volunteers and we bring this to you for um you know for the good of the industry for the benefit of the water sector and we hope uh this is content that is relevant to you uh, so do fill out that exit poll in the end and let us know what do you want to see next what's uh, what what would be the most relevant for your work uh, we can issue certificates of ascent attendance to you that you'll get um, so if you need professional development hours uh, there's one out of the way for you so uh, that that'll be provided to you have a look at some of the other resources coming your way we are very excited again next week we'll talk pathogens so uh, kind of a follow-on to what we're talking about today and then if you want to try this download yourself uh, go to to open AI and download yourself some chat GPT. Start asking it some questions. What is eDNA? See how smart the artificial intelligence is at the moment. And then join us for a cool little interactive discussion about it where we're going to put it to the test and see how can we use uh, AI for the water sector. That'll be fun. And then we've got uh, some geomorphology coming up and a few other topics that are very relevant to what we've talked about today. So have a look at these. Join us again for uh, future webinars and courses. Uh, we're excited to be able to bring you this content, and we're happy to uh, share that with you. And, uh, you know, again, make the world a better place uh, through water resources. So with that, uh, we'll sign off for today and we'll see you next time with the Australian Water School. Thank you.